With so much death around us these days, it's hard to single out the importance of individual contributions to our society. But tonight we're taking note of a man who shaped the TV news industry here and beyond. Sunbeam Television executive Ed Anson, owner of WHDH, WLVI, and his flagship station, WSVN in Miami, who died Sunday at the age of 84. If you aren't familiar with him, you certainly know his style. Emily Rooney has this report. Ed Anson marked his newscast with a branding iron. He championed fast-paced, visually compelling newscasts that are anything but boring. Anson's Miami Vice-style news was already legendary when he bought locally owned Channel 7 in 1993. The emphasis will be on developing a strong news franchise and a competitive news program that the viewers in Boston will like. And they did. Channel 7 shot ahead in the ratings, but Anson was unsentimental, dumping popular and well-paid anchors like Kim Carrigan, replacing them with fungible faces and lower salaries. Stories often centered on crime, animals, and weird tales of ghostly apparitions. A ghost is walking the aisles of the popular grocery store. Dismissed as sensationalist by some, Anson was unapologetic. You had to be creative, innovative. You can't afford to be boring. Four years ago, Anson took NBC to court over loss of its affiliation, a battle he lost. Hard-charging, philanthropic, and a workaholic, he once told the Boston Globe, I want to die with my boots on, which he did, spending last Friday at the office. This is really his proudest moment to be the only independent station that's ever been number one in prime time in the entire country. Even if not number one in news, TV was his passion. Ed Anson was one of those guys who just thought local TV was close to the people. And on that, Ed Anson was surely right. Mike Nikitas, you are the guy amongst us who knows uh, local TV news, I'm going to say, from the inside out uh, the best. Can you talk through what the Boston market was known for before Ed Anson came here and expand, I guess, on Emily's points about the way he may have changed the sensibility in Boston. Well, I think Emily did a wonderful job of capturing who he was and his impact. Uh, love him or hate him, and there were plenty of people in both camps. Uh, the man was a huge figure in broadcasting, both locally and for the impact he had on local newscast and national newscast, I think nationwide. I remember in 1993, I was working at NECM, he bought Channel 7, and people said, oh, my God, it's the Antichrist. Come to town. He's going to change everything. He's going to make this the worst news town. This is the best local news in the country, Boston. I remember Michael Dukakis writing a piece about that. People were really, really upset. Um, he increased the story count. He increased the pace. He, uh, uh, he, he also did more news. They do 70 hours of news now. That's more, I think, than any other station in Boston. They came up with better graphics. I remember uh, sitting around and we were watching their news and somebody had come over from Channel 7 and they said, do you know that they have a breaking news animation that's pre-made? And we all thought that was the most sensational, crazy thing. But guess what? <laughs> it may have sounded silly now, but sounds silly now, but watch any CNN newscast and the first two words out of Wolf Blitzer's mouth, and don't have any break is breaking news. Uh, you can say a lot. I think there was this battle with uh, NBC over the affiliation that he gave a lot of money to a lot of causes, millions of dollars locally. And I'll just add this one other thing. He understood what people wanted, and he understood how to give it to them. And because of that, he was a success. success. It worked, and it's still working. So, I mean, I think you have to give him big props for emphasizing local. Local was very important to him. And, um, you know, he did have a, he, he, he was all about what was happening locally. Where I think he missed the mark a bit in Boston is that local in Boston also means some familiar faces. And so not having kept some of those familiar faces, I think there was a way to have done b what he did in Miami and incorporate a little bit of the Boston style. And who knows what they might have been able to do after that. Uh, in terms of sustainability, because for a while, of course, he was the only one in town doing a lot of this stuff, so he got a lot of attention. One more less substantive comment I will make. I remember watching some of those newscasts, and the women anchors were wearing these dangly earrings, which was such a no-no in the early days of <laughs> TV news anchors. And I was like, oh, my God, these are nightclub earrings. What is happening? So here we are. <laughs>
Well, yeah, here we are. The nightclub hearings give way to the cocktail dresses. I mean, it, it's amazing how prescient he was when you look at cable news today and all of the things that he apparently, and I wasn't uh, working in the industry at the time, but that, that he pioneered and, and, and launched and made familiar. And now, you know, to, to the point sometimes of absurdity, you sometimes turn on CNN and they'll have breaking news, debate coming in a half hour, and that's not breaking news. But all of those flashes, all of those bells and whistles, the camera angles, the sense of excitement that that has to undergird a broadcast. Now, it's funny, you, you watch something like PBS NewsHour, which is wonderful and substantive, and God bless them, but boy, they slow jam the news, and it's a really, really different feel. And what Ed, what was cutting edge for Ed Anson in 93 is now par for the course. Well, I noticed that none of us are talking about the news. Um, let me say a couple of things in favor of Ed Anson's stewardship of Channel 7. First of all, I think it's terrific that there was an independent owner in this market because all the other broadcast stations are part of these faceless uh, uh, corporations that, you know, who would you call up if you wanted to complain? With Channel 7, you could, you, he was uh, visible. He was quoted, he was interviewed, and I think that was great. Uh, the other thing I like is that he kept Channel 7 downtown. Everybody else is way out in the suburbs. Uh, that said, you know, it was tabloid news. And not only did the uh, flashy graphics and the ultra-fast pacing and all the things that we've been talking about affect Channel 7, but it affected all the other channels in the market. And... Um, as Mike said at the top, Boston had the reputation of having the best local TV news in the country. And I think it's still better here than it is in a lot of other markets. But uh, I don't think that the effect of all this flash and graphics and rapid pacing and everything has really served the public very well. We've only got about a minute left, but I, Dan, you bring up a question that I've wondered about for a long time as someone who's lived here 25 years. Uh, was Anson sort of the harbinger of a change that was going to come here one way or another, and he just happened to be the vehicle for it in the Boston market? Or do you guys think, and I guess I'll give this to you, Mike, to close with, given our time, uh, would things have stayed the way they were, more stayed and, and buttoned down, if Anson hadn't brought what he brought? I think it would have taken a longer time because uh, it would have taken longer to get to Boston, but I think it would have happened. And I think we'd still be where we are right now because Boston would have been left in the dust as far as competition and making money, uh, you know, locally, the stations. That's going to do it for our show this week. Tell us what you think. Email us, tweet us, send us a comment. We are always on at beatthepress.org.